Okay, saints, come on in the house. Come on in the house. Let's get ready to get into God's word to hear what God has to say to us. Give a loved one a call. Just tell them. All I'm asking you for is just, you ain't even got to give us 40 minutes. Just just start with it. Give us, give us 15. If God don't say nothing to you by 15 minutes, jump off. But if God speaks to you, roll with us. I assure you, God has something to say to you, for you, that will bring you through. So, saints, get yourself something to write with. Get your tablets or whatever device you're going to go with. But what you need to do is definitely get something to write with. Don't trust your brain to try to retain this information because the devil is going to do his best to try to steal it. So we got about one minute and this train is pulling out the station, saints. saints so i won't be distracted with who is in the house and who's not i pray that you're one that's here and if not well i pray that you check it out later on see what god has to say to you with, with that said saints i want you to gear yourselves up we're going to acts acts the 26th chapter we are in acts we're moving through the book of acts saints. we're coming to the latter part of the uh, book of acts and we are now in the 26th chapter and now now that we're here in the natural and getting ready to do spiritual warfare, we need to step from the natural into the spiritual. How do we do that, saints? Well, prayer. Prayer is nothing but an earthly request for heavenly wisdom. So let's request some wisdom that God may be able to give us a good understanding of what he's trying to convey to us today via the word. Going before the throne of grace, Father. We honor you, we bless you, and we thank you once again for giving us this opportunity to come before the throne of grace. We thank you, Lord, that it is not predicated on us in any way, form, or fashion. For if it was, we are unworthy and will always be unworthy to come before our holy and a righteous God. But through the blood of Jesus, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that give us this right that we can boldly come before the throne of grace. Because you're not looking at us and our credits, Lord God, but the credit card, Lord God, of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We can boldly come before the throne of grace, Lord, and make our request known unto you. But before we say that, that we just want to tell you thank you we want to say we love you we bless you because of who you are and all you have done for what you have done in the past what you are doing in the present and what you will do in the future lord we just want to tell you we love you we thank you and thank you lord for just choosing us now as we have done what you have commanded us to do come before your presence with thanksgiving you have told us father that make our requests known unto you lord i plead the blood of jesus right now that you make the saints minds ready to receive the word from you, Lord God. So we want to start, Lord God, by of our own free will, giving the Holy Spirit the power of attorney over the message tonight. We, Lord God, totally let him have his way. Give us an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord says unto the body of Christ, that we may apply, Lord, his words to our life, because everything you say to us, Lord, is for our own good. So I say, Lord, please bless the saints that are here, that they may stay in the moment. Remove, Lord God, all distractions, that they may be able to stay focused on your word, Lord God, to get everything that you have set for them. Lord, I pray, Lord, to the saints that will not be here with us tonight, Lord God, for whatever reason, Father, I pray that you bless them that at a later date they study this message to find out what is it that you have in it for them. Now, Lord, to those saints that are in route trying to get to a safe place where they are able to view the message and be able to enjoy us, Lord, for Wednesday night Bible study, I plead the blood of Jesus that you bless them, Lord, that they may get to a safe place, Lord, that they may be able to hear the word of God set for them. Lord, we want to tell you we thank you, we love you, we bless your name because of who you are and all that you have done. Now, this is a prayer that we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to deliver to the Father, for it is in the name and under the blood of our Lord and our Savior. For you are Jesus. You are the Christ. Now, if you're in agreement with that prayer, saints, you just signify by saying amen. And amen is just saying, I'm in agreement with what you said. So that's why it's important for you always to listen to what someone is saying before you say amen to it. Because you don't want to put your blessings on something that may be a mess or a curse. So no, understand your authority and your power and who, what God is giving you, who you are and whose you are, and you'll know what authority and power that God is giving you. So glad to see you saints today. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Acts, the 26th chapter, and we're going to use our ever popular slingshot effect. We're going to go back and we're going to touch on the verses that we studied last week, and we're going to go to the new information 
today it be the Lord's will. So what we did, we stopped off, guys. We, um, we ended up last week, um, we went down to verse number 15. We completed that. We started at verse number 9. So we're going to touch that, rehash that with old information, then jump into some new information if it be God's will. Amen? Okay, so in verse number 9, um, Acts the 26th chapter, verse number 9, here's the account here. Paul, remember, he has um, set his scene up. He is before um, our audience, and he's able to speak on his own behalf. But this is just not ordinary audience. This is a massive audience that he's in front of. He's in front of King Agrippa. He's in front of Festus that's over the, um, the Roman part. He is over the, um, where he's also there with the, the Jewish leaders because all of them have come in and when a king comes into town, pomp and circumstances take place and all of these people come in, people from everywhere. So Paul has a large audience and he has a right by um, Festus and King Agrippa to speak on his own behalf. And he is really letting go the word of God to be able to speak to the people of God. And I tell you, you have to have yourself ready so when you have an audience that God wants you to speak before, don't be intimidated by their titles. Don't be intimidated by what they're, um, who they are. What God wants you to do, to be, do is to be able to speak. Speak on behalf of the Lord Jesus. Your testimony is the most awesome weapon of war with the word of God that we can use. The devil don't want you to give that. So you have an audience. You don't know what to say. You tell people what God has done for you. But this is the account here. Paul in verse number nine, he says, Paul is giving an account before God, um, um, the transition from where he was and to where God put him. And so this is what he says. He says, I really thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Which things I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, with chief priests, and with them, and chief priests when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them all in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I. I persecuted them even, persecuted them even unto strange city, strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecuteth thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the brick. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thy persecuted. So you see, Paul is standing before King Agrippa. Now, here is something that's very, very important, guys. I want you to focus again before we move forward. I want you to focus back in verse number um, 9 and 10. For that is a very important, very important and key verses. No, 9 and 11. So this is what he said. He says, he says um, I really thought to myself that I ought, to, I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. What he's saying is, I thought about how, how cruel can I be to the people of God? How cruel can I be to these Christians? How can I make them suffer? That's what Paul was saying. I, I constantly thought, how can I, how can I do, how can I just make them suffer? Because that was his intent. And you can notice the modus operandi of the devil when you look at this. Because if you look, look at verse number 10, he says, which things I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests and when, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice I gave my voice against him. But listen what he says here in verse number 11. As I was looking over this, it caught my attention. He says, and I, he said, and I pressured them all. He said, and I punished them all in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. So you can see where this thing was, not only did he want to punish them, but he wanted to make them renounce Jesus. And that's what he was saying. I want to compel them to blaspheme, to turn against. I want to make them 
say that this thing is not. And that's what the devil want to do with you. He wants you to renounce what you have said about Jesus. He wants you to renounce what you have told people Jesus have done for you. The devil, first of all, he wants you to shut up and not tell no one anything about this Jesus. But if you do talk, he want to make sure you eat them words. And that's what Paul was doing. He said, I ran them from city to city. I did everything I could to him. I tried them. I, 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 I want them to blaspheme the name of Jesus. That's what he was saying. Again, he says, and being exceedingly mad against them. What he's saying that they, what else can I do to make them suffer? There is a time that's coming, saints, when that very thing we will be facing, people will be rabid in their minds trying to make you suffer for the name of Jesus. Because when you proclaim the name of Jesus and obey the word of God, God's word is truth. Truth is clear. It's yes or no, right or wrong, black or white. There is no gray in this thing. And so the thing is the world wants gray because gray can be what they want it to be. And so because you stand standing firm on the word of God and what God says, if God said it's right, it's right. If God said it's wrong, it's wrong. If God said don't be a part of it, don't be a part of it. If God says holes attached to it, you attach to it. But the world wants to make you, if God say attach, they want you to detach. If God says it's right, they want you to say it's wrong. And you're going to find out the more you do this, the more they're going to hate you and they're going to become rabid in their minds not to hear nothing you have to say. What they're going to do is make you, they want to make you, they want to punish you. They want to make you suffer. So what they would do is try to take your job or take your income, take your health, take everything they can from you. They want you to, to suffer. That's what the devil wants because he wants you to renounce the name of Jesus. That's what Paul was trying to do. And he says, I persecuted them to... Um, um, persecuted them even unto strange cities. Cities he had nothing to do with. People are going to follow you and chase you just because you stood for the name of Christ. Some people have nothing else to do but just to follow and just to harass you. It's a spirit. Remember, what are we not dealing with? We're not dealing with a... We're not dealing with a... We're not dealing with a... We're dealing with a spirit. And to you all that have been with us for some time, y'all know what those symbols mean. We're not dealing with a face. We're not dealing with a place. We're not dealing with a voice. It's a spirit. And that spirit will pursue you until the day you die. That spirit is going to harass you to the day you die. And so that's what Paul was saying. He said, upon where I went to Damascus, and um, Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, and, mid, and he said, in midday, okay, I saw. Now remember, he's talking to Festus, um, the highest ranking Roman um, leader there. He's talking to King Agrippa. He's talking to Bernice. He's talking to all of the um, the Jewish um, leaders there. He's talking to everybody that is there. He is giving his testimony. And look at the passion of him, guys, talking about his testimony. Now, people can tell other people what God has done for you. But what they cannot do is tell, they can't tell other people how you can tell them what God has done for you. They don't know about the dark spot that you was in or the dark place that you was in and how when God delivered you, how you felt. And you, when you give your testimony, there's no need for you to put a lid on it. You hooray and hoop and holler in a basketball, football, or some kind of sports venue. But yet, when it comes to talking about how Jesus has delivered you, they're telling you to put it on calm. No, baby, what you need to do is be that person with such a passion and tell them about the goodness of Jesus that they want you to be the one to do the commercial. Because your passion would draw people in. And that's what Paul was saying on my journey. He said, um, he said at, at midday, okay, I saw in the way a light. From heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining about me and them that was journeyed with me. And when we was uh, all falling to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the prick. So what he's saying is God has already established this. Uh, this is the way I want you to go. And see, the thing is, when you see with cowboys, when you see them riding on um Horses, you will see them with their cowboy boots, but on their boots they had spurs. Now those spurs on their boots was not just to look cool. The point was when they was riding with that horse, they would hit that horse with them spurs and the horse would, you know, go forward. If they want them to go this way, they'll kick this foot the other way, so on. And so that's what God is saying. If God wants you to go some way and you decide you're going to go the way you want to go, it's going to stick you. Now one thing about stick, guys, it, you, you can't fake it when you are stuck. You can't do that. You can play sleep all you want to, but if someone took a needle and poked you, 
you, you know, you're going to come out of that fake sleep. And so that's what God is saying. Paul, you keep fighting against me, but you see what I'm doing here. It's hard for you to fight against this. And again, 15, he says, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thy persecutor. So what he's saying is he's got Paul's attention in verse number 15. Jesus finally got his attention. And I asked the question, what did he have to do to get your attention? He had to lay you on your back, take your job, take something from you, threaten your health. What is it that God had to do to get your attention? Now, the question is, verse number 16, now that he's got your attention, now what? So he says in verse number 16, now, he don't told him what to do. You're on your back. He says to him, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose and to make thee a minister and a witness, both to the, both of them, both of these things which are, which thou hast seen and those things which, those things in the which I have appeared unto thee. So what he is saying is, I need you to get up and get moving. Now that God has gotten your attention, he wants you to get about the business that he has called you to get about. I need you to go and deal with some things here. He said, I'm pointing out, God is pointing out some things here in verse number 16, he's saying to Paul. He says, but arise and get on your feet. You can't stay down. Okay, so life start lifing and it puts you on your back. You can't stand there crying about what was, what you once had, or what you lost. You need to get up, shake the dust off your feet, and get it moving. God knew exactly what it was that you was going to lose or what was going to go against you. But God has equipped you to deal with such a thing. So get up and quit crying about it and let's move, saints. God knows about it. So God says, um, but arise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. I, want to, I got your attention for this reason. I need you to get moving, to make thee a minister and a witness, both unto the uh, both of the things which thou both of the things which thou hast seen, and those things which um, the things in the which I will appear unto you. So what he's saying to guys, I need you to understand. I need you to be a witness of what you have already seen and be prepared to tell about what I'm gonna show you. God is getting your attention, saints. Don't make him scream louder. Because God has a way of definitely having you to conform to his will. And so that's what's the thing you need to point out. You need to understand this. God wants you to understand he needs you to get up. So what? You lost it. Whatever it was. Be it that it was a person. Be it that it was a vehicle or job. Money, whatever it was, you lost it. Big deal. God had to get your attention. I would rather lose it and be in line with God than to have it and not walk with God. Why do you think God takes some things from you? Because you're not hearing him. So God will allow a hard time to fall on you to get your attention. That's what he did with Paul. You can think you're doing the right thing. Paul thought he was doing the right thing. He even had the backing of the religious people. He had the backing of the religious people. But God says, no, you're not doing the right thing. You're fighting against me. So you need to be careful who you align yourself with. Because that person, although they may be saying Jesus, they may not mean Jesus. They may be having you to fight against the things of Jesus. Don't put your mouth on people that you don't know what um, know about that person. Pray for them. Pray for him. And so that's what Paul, um, Paul was saying there. He said, and that's what God was telling Paul, I need you to do. I need you to get ready. And tell about the things that you have gone through. And I also need you to be prepared to tell the people about the things that I'm going to show you. Don't keep it to yourself. God needs you talking now. That's what God wants for you. In verse number 17, he says, delivering, he says, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom, unto whom I sent thee. So what he is saying is, I want you to focus on something here. He says, delivering thee from the people. That's the Jewish people. And. And is a conjunction word. So not just the it not just the Gentiles. So everything, you only have two races of people that God see on the face of the earth. That's Jew and Gentile. Jew, a Gentile is everybody that's not a Jew. Okay? So Jew and Gentile. So when he's saying delivering thee from the people, that's, that's Gentile. So that's Romans and whatever else that was. Greeks or whatever, Syrians and the Jews. So he said um, delivering from the people and from the Gentiles. So the Jews and the Gentiles 
um, unto whom now I send thee. So what God says, he has delivered them from the Gentiles and the Jews. For what purpose? Well, God wanted to get Paul aside to educate him. And then I'm going to send you right back to them people. Sometimes God will pull you out of that crowd to change your thinking, which would then change your heart, which would then change your words, which would then change your actions. And then God will send you right back amongst those people so that you can be an example to them. Because those people know you best. And when they see what God has done through you and in you, then what they will say then, if God did it in him, and through him, then God can do it in me and through me. Because these people know you. God is always going to send you back to the people that knows you best. Because they got to be able to see what God has done. See, if you never, ever, ever knew me and you heard me proclaiming the word of God, then you would say, well, you know, okay, that's a, that's a godly man. But then again, if you knew me when I was in my earlier years, now, I can say for me, I thank God, saints, that God has had a hold of me all since I was a child. But some of you guys don't have that testimony. Some of you were some pretty rough fellas. Y'all were some pretty rough people. And so people didn't know the you that used to, the you that used to be. So the thing is, there are some people who remember the other you. And sometimes they remind you of the other you. But it's not for you to bask in the other you. It's for you to tell them about what God has done in you and through you and said, well, the, uh, therefore the other you has no more bearing over you. God loves you and care for you. So God says after that, um, latter part of verse number 17, unto whom now I send thee. So God delivered you from these people to send you back to him. Why? He's got something, you got something to say now. Once you have had an encounter with Jesus, now you have something to say. And people will listen. Remember this set, this room setting we have here. You have all these hierarchy of people. You have the chief priests. You have the Roman leadership. You have the uh, king, the Jewish king. All of them are sitting there listening to Paul. And he's giving his testimony. So he has an audience and they are spellbound listening to what God has done for them. Oh, I love to hear people testimony of where God brought them from. Oh, I love to hear the testimony of how God delivered them. How God brought them out. Every now and then, you need to have a picture of what you used to be and show people that picture and say, who is this? They'd be like, I don't know. Who was that? It was me. It was me. And so when people see that, they would look and say, wow, God has done a great work. And so what he's saying is, now that God has brought you out, taken care of you and build you up in the word, then sent you back to those people. He says in verse number 18, for what purpose did God send you back? He says in 18, to open their eyes. And to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance amongst them which are sanctified by faith in faith that is in me. Who is me? Paul? No. Who is me? You? No. Faith that is in Christ. Now, I want to exegete this, and I want you to see this really closely, guys, so you can see exactly what it is God is showing you. Look at the beginning. He says, to open their eyes. So the purpose of God saving you, and you're getting into the word and learning the word of God, is so you can talk to the lost and give them clarity and understanding. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Now, the problem we have in the body of Christ is because of the actions of some Christians, you are turning the loss to darkness. They don't see no difference from you and them. You sure sound like them. You act like them. You look like them. So how can you act, look, and speak like them, turn them to Christ? Your purpose, your duty, my duty, the word of God says, is to open their eyes. Now, when their eyes are open, what are you going to let them see? You? Why would God deliver them out the world so you could take them back into the world? That, that makes no sense. But that's what a lot of Christians are doing. You're going to act like the world and say it don't make a difference you as a believer how you act. Well, what's the purpose of God delivering them out of the world if you're going to act like the world? That makes no sense at all, saints. 
So God is calling us to a standard. And it's amazing what your flesh will talk you into believing is okay. As if to say, well, God already saved me, so it don't matter what I do. Oh, really? So what's the limit to what you do? So since it don't matter to God what you do once God has saved you, so is it okay for me to sit up on the corner and shoot up with a needle and get high? Is it okay for me to walk down the street in my birthday suit, looking at every person of every culture and offering them a, a certain part of my anatomy? D do it make sense? Since it, since it don't matter, do it not matter if I, if I being um, a saved, married man, decide to go out and do my own thing? Do it not matter? At what point do you say it do matter? It matters, guys. God did not save you that you could do the same thing. And so he's saying to Paul, your purpose is the upright after you have had an experience with Jesus and he have delivered you and saved you. He wants you to open the eyes of those that are around you. How do you do that? He says, and turn them from darkness into light. Well, darkness is the way of the world. Light is the way of God. So when you turn them to the way of God and from the power of Satan, what is the power of Satan? The power of Satan is sin. Sin is what holds us captive unto the power of God. Now, God is the one, you can find out, guys, God is the one, when you turn to the power of God, that means you have the authority. I'm no longer bound by sin. I don't have to do this no more. See, before Christ, you were bound by sin. You had no choice. You just did the things of your nature. But when you came and gave your life to Christ, and Christ came in and ruled your life, now I'm no longer bound by darkness. I'm bound by righteousness of God. And so that's what he's saying from turning them from Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin. That's the first thing. Now, what is the forgiveness of sin? Eternal life. Eternal life and the inheritance. So what God's saying is now that you have, have the forgiveness of sin, you have eternal life. There are things that God wants to give you while you're here on earth. There are things that God wants to do for you right now in your life. You have an inheritance. What is the inheritance? God has given inheritance to the righteous. When you obey God, there are benefits to that. So there are things that God wants you to have. It is God's pleasure to see you blessed. That's what God wants to see his saints blessed. God wants to be able to the world to see when you go through a crisis, how they ought to handle themselves. But the problem is, Christians go through a crisis and that crazier than the world do. Why would God want them to see that? So he's saying that inheritance among which are sanctified by faith in him, um, by faith that is in him. So what we want to do is we want to have faith in Christ Jesus. I keep telling you, don't have no faith in no man because you're going to be disappointed. Don't have no faith in no system. You're going to be disappointed. Have faith in Christ Jesus. And I promise you, you will never be disappointed. For God will never fail you. He will always see you through. So you have to have a relationship with God and learn him. Listen, from the time God called me into ministry, I made God a promise. And I want you to remember this always, saying, I made God a promise. And that promise was that I would teach the people of God about the Holy Ghost. Because Jesus said, I have to go, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to give you a comforter. So the Holy Spirit is what I'll tell you about. He is the one you need to learn more about. He is the one you need to welcome into your life. It is he that navigates you through the questionable parts of life. He is he when you're making that decision, when you are, are want to go the wrong way. It is he that navigates and poke you with the prick to say that's wrong. It is the Holy Spirit when you are down and feel like you are trodden over. It is he that lifts you up. It is he that navigates you through the tr um, trouble parts of life. It is he that is a friend that comforts you when you feel like nobody else cares, when you feel like you are overwhelmed. It is he that has begun to carry that load for you. The Holy Spirit you need to learn about. He is your friend. He is the gift that God has given you. Every believer, you have him, but you don't know about him. The world trying to make you ashamed of him. The devil tell you he's not necessary, but the only one that has been proven to beat the devil is the Holy Spirit. He has a perfect record against Satan. He knows every last one of his tricks. There is nothing Satan can do to beat him. 
So the only thing Satan do to you and to me is talk us out of listening to him. I can promise you, you have never listened to the Holy Ghost and fell in the wrong place. He's always going to lead you through. Even when you lose it all, to lose it all with him, you have it all. But to have it all without him, you have none. And so what God wants you to do is to have the Holy Spirit. That's your gift. And see, so many times we abuse it. There is nothing worse than when you have taken the time, taken the time to package your gift and your heart is in that gift. Everything, you, you package that gift with everything that is in you. And you gave it to a person from your heart. And the person looks at it and say, okay, and throw it to the side. You are hurt. It hurts you to see that. Well, the Holy Spirit is the gift. He is the package that God has given you. And so many of us toss him to the side. That's why you see Christians can say anything, can act any way, can go anywhere and have no shame. Because they have taken the gift and thrown them to the side. But God says, no, that's not you. I want you to be able to utilize that gift. There's a lot of benefits in it when you are able to use that gift. The Holy Spirit, it is not a it. He is a he. He's a part of the Godhead, equal to the other two. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all of them are God, are one. None are greater than the other. So there's no little God on the throne, but look at Jesus as less. And the Holy Spirit is less. No, 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 no. Equal, the triune God. So saints, I say to you, that's what God is saying to you. So he has equipped you to tell people about the goodness of God and to stand and to bring them out of darkness into light, to bring them from Satan to God, for you to be standing up that people don't look on you, but they may be able to look at God that is in you. Because if they're looking at you, you're going to mislead them. If they're looking at you, the devil is going to set them up for failure. Verse number 19, he says... Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient upon the heavenly vision. So again, remember, Paul is standing there before all of these, um, all of these high-powered people. So he said to King Agrippa, he says, "Listen, I need you to understand something. Now, when this put, when the Holy Spirit put me on my back and spoke to me and told me who He was and told me what He wanted me to do, I was not disobedient to that Spirit, brother." Whereupon, or wait, again, verse number 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly calling. So what he's saying is what God has called me to do, I got about the business. And I started right there where I was at. You don't have to worry about saying, well, tomorrow I'm going to get at No, start right then. And how do you start right then? You start by repenting before God and getting it right. Arming yourself up, gearing yourself up, ready to get about God's business. So when God show you something, you don't sit there and just ponder. I wonder what that means. If God, if God shows you you're going into a place and all of a sudden you see a vision that everybody is running and ducking, you don't stand there in the midst of that place and say, I wonder what everybody's running from. No, I'm going to run to safety. And then I find out later on what everybody's running from. You stand right there and keep on, um, and keep on trying to figure out what they're running from. If everybody is running from there and running your way, why are you going to run that way? You better turn around and start running. You may find out when you get there, why well, y'all run? I don't know. I, just, I saw everybody running. I started running too. They ain't just running for no reason. So the point that's being made is God is saying, um, Paul is saying to King Agrippa, he's saying, oh King, oh King, I didn't disobey God right there. I started to doing what he told me to do. Are you that person? Are you ready to do what God has told you to do right then, right there? Why do you keep waiting on God when God is waiting on you? I have said this and I will continue saying this. If you are waiting on God, that is because God is backing up. Now, what does that mean? If somebody's backing up, that means they got to come back to where you at. So you ain't ahead of God. God is way ahead of you. So your job, my job, is to hear what thus says the Lord and do what God has told us to do. And that's what Paul is saying right here in verse number 19. Okay, he got my attention. He made me hear him clearly. Now, when we study the story of Paul, um, his road to Damascus, you remember there were scales that came over his eyes. So now he was put down on the ground and because of the brightness of the light, he was blind. 
So you were strong and able to do yourself. When God blind you, then you have to be led by somebody and you're subject to the people that are leading you. Because if they wanted to play games, if you are blind and a person want to play games, like put you in a place by yourself or leave you, where you going to go? Blind means, blind means you are totally dependent on someone else. You cannot do it yourself. You can't do it yourself, especially in an unfamiliar place because you don't know how. You don't know what things are. So they were blind. And God is telling them, I want you to be led. And so you'll see right there, he says, guys, again, he says, he says, but show first unto them of Damascus and at um, Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and, um, and, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So Paul is saying, God has pointed out to me and told me to start right there. So he started right in Damascus. Why Damascus? Because that's where it all went down. On the road to Damascus, and when God laid him on his back, they got Paul up and they took Paul and took him to Damascus where he was sitting there. And what they did with him is immediately began to show him things, uh, began to tell him. And Paul was in fasting, would not eat, would not sleep until he was waiting on a certain person that God said he's going to send him. But Paul started once that came and God has opened Paul's eyes again and Paul was ready to roll. He started in Damascus proclaiming the word of God, proclaiming Jesus the Christ. Then he went to Jerusalem and then he went to all the coast of Judea and then he went to the Gentiles. Then he started telling everybody about Jesus. Start where you are. Do what you can. Use what you have. Let God have his way and the rest you leave up to God and God will have his way with this matter. Don't wait until you become perfect. You will never get there. You tell people about the goodness that God has done for you. You tell people about how God has brought you out. You tell people how you was in bondage and God got you free. And if you are able to do those things, people will accept you right where you at and then you can move on. Don't wait till you become some best-selling author. Don't wait till you become this well-known person. Start telling people about what Jesus has done for you right now where you are in your life. And then as God promotes you up the ladder, you can then begin to tell a wider audience. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. And the rest, we'll leave it up to God. How big of a stage he gives you. Oh, saints, thank you for the time that we have had in the word of God. I told you, it wouldn't be long at all. What is it that God has given you? Father, I thank you, I honor you, and I bless you for the time that we have had in your word. Oh, Father, bless us that we may hold to that which you have given us and take those words, Lord, that are in our ears and apply them to our hearts and start acting on these things. Oh, Father, forgive us for all the things that we have done wrong against you, but help us, Lord, that we may take now that you have opened us up to a new life and obey you. Help us that we may grow according to your law, your statute in your way. Please, Lord, do not allow your saints to let the devil steal the word that has been given to us tonight. And if you do this for us, Lord, we will be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Now, this is a prayer that we ask the Holy Spirit to deliver to the Father, for it is both in the name and under the blood of our Lord and our Savior. For you are Jesus. You are the Christ. Now, let me ask, are you one that have heard the word tonight and it has spoken to you? And you say, well, Lord, um, maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you say, okay, I hear it. What was your Damascus experience? You got my attention, Lord. I'm ready to do that, what you have called me to do. So if you're one that's out there and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you would like to know him as your Lord and Savior, I want to walk you through God's plan of salvation. But before we move any further, let me speak to the one that once knew Jesus. You were one that once knew Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And you turned and walked away from him. And now you would like to rededicate your life to Christ. Come, walk with me with the person that never knew Jesus. You, the one that once knew him and now would like to get back in line with him. Just repeat after me. Say, Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this door that you have opened before me. And I take full advantage of the opportunity and walk through this door. Walking through this door by saying, Lord, forgive me for the life of sin that I have been living. Forgive me, Lord, for living your life 
my way. If you, Lord Jesus, will come into my life, I will serve you all the days of my life. With that said, by my own free will, I open my mouth and I repent of the life of sin I have been living. And I open my mouth to say, I accept Jesus as being my Lord and my Savior. I ask you, Jesus, to come and sit on the throne of my heart. If you would do this, Lord, I will serve you all the days of my life. I, ex Lord God, I expect you to rule my life and I will obey. Thank you, Jesus, for ruling me. Thank you, Lord, for receiving me. Thank you, Lord, for leading me. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of Almighty God. Welcome home. If you're that person, please let us know. Put it in the comment section. We would like to celebrate with you because of what Christ has done for you and God has let, um, delivered you through. To you that has come back home, thank you. You have been greatly missed. You have so much to offer to the kingdom. Let's get about God's business. Now, you may ask, what do I do now that I have given my life to Christ and have gotten saved? Well, you get in a good Bible-believing church and you load up on the Word, learn the Word of God, and then act their own. You may say, well, I don't know the Word of God like that. I don't know a church to go to. Well, stay right here with us. Grow in the Word with us. And we look forward to, as you grow, that you will hear clearly from the Holy Spirit as to what He wants you to do next. You say, well, I want to be a part of Firm Foundation. How do I become a member of Firm Foundation? Well, we ask two questions. One, do you believe that the Bible is the true word of God? You may say, yes, I do believe that with all my heart. Okay, you're halfway there. Now, the next question, are you willing to obey the rules and the regulations of this ministry so as long as they line up with the word of God? You say, yeah, I'm willing to do that. Well, then we say, welcome to Firm Foundation Outreach Ministry, a ministry that loves people right where they are and promote them and push them to what God want them to be. Now, if you will put that in the comment section, we will celebrate with you for that. You may say, well, I want to come and visit you guys. Where are you located? We are located at 1851 Highway 66 South in Kernersville in the state of North Carolina. Google it, guys. Google it. We would love to see you. We are, guys, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. at church. Actually, we're there at 9, Christian Education. So come in and get Christian Education with us. And then service starts at 10 a.m. Sun uh, Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We would love to have you come join with us and be a part of the ministry. And you say, I want to support it. How do I give to the ministry? Right here on our channel, right here on our page. We have a QR code to where you can give there, guys. Listen, every time we so appreciate Every time you give to the building of the kingdom of God with this ministry, we use it for the kingdom of God. No shady business. Everything, guys, because of your giving, we are able to make sure the bills are paid. We are able to give to other ministries that do things that's bigger than us right now. We are able to, in any way, form, or fashion, be a blessing to the things of God in the house of God. Take care of the things that God has commanded us to take care of. None of this money is taken and the po uh, pastor is pocketing all of the money and taking it back. No, no, no. Pastors don't even have nothing to do with the money. We love God and we love you and we will never betray God. So therefore, we'll never betray you if your heart is towards God. Look forward to seeing you right here on this page, right here on this channel. Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Sunday, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. You be blessed. In Jesus' name, we love you.